Good afternoon and welcome to Georgetown University on this beautiful first day of autumn. My name is Tim Beach, Professor of Geography and Geosciences here in the School of Foreign Service Program in Science, Technology, and International Affairs. Less than 200 million years ago, a short time in Earth's history, Earth's astounding history, the land beneath us was sutured together with Africa. We have the rare occasion at Georgetown when this podium is occupied by two geoscientists, the field that studies this astounding history as well as energy, the topic of today, and one of our most important challenges. Our speaker today, of course, is Mr. T. Boone Pickens, here to talk about his plan for alternative energy. Mr. Pickens is a ge geologist by training, a leading philanthropist, and one of America's most prominent captains of the energy industry. For a full and proper introduction, we now turn to President of Georgetown University, Jack DeJoya. Thank you very much, Tim. And it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to Gaston Hall. For over a century, this has been one of Washington's most important places for public discussion and discourse on the most important issues of our time, and we continue that tradition today. We're privileged to have with us this afternoon noted entrepreneur and businessman T. Boone Pickens, who will speak about his plan for reducing our dependence on foreign oil. In this time of globalization, and as the events of this past week have shown in this moment of such volatility and unpredictability in our economy, we must take the time to re-examine those practices which we have come to accept as business as usual, and we must listen to the voices of innovation so that we may invest meaningfully in our future. It's fitting that we hold this discussion today 115 years ago on this very day, before there was a Ford or Chrysler, Charles and Frank Durier debuted the world's first automobile in Springfield, Massachusetts. And on this day in 1953, the first four-level freeway interchange was opened in Los Angeles, California. These two events not only revolutionized transportation and technology, they also mark major milestones on our road to foreign energy dependence. Perhaps no one understands the issues, dangers, and repercussions surrounding our dependence on foreign oil better than T. Boone Pickens. Born in Oklahoma, his father was a landman managing oil company business arrangements. Our guest later graduated from Oklahoma A&M, now Oklahoma State University, with a degree in geology in 1951. By 1956, he had founded Mesa Petroleum, an independent exploration and oil production company. By 1981, Mesa Petroleum had grown into one of the largest independent oil companies in the world. T. Boone Pickens was named CEO of the decade in 1989 by Financial Times. He founded BP Capital Management in 1997 to develop clean energy initiatives, was listed as one of the 100 most influential people of the petroleum century by the oil and gas investor in 1998 and is currently on the New York Times bestseller list for his book, The First Billion is the Hardest. Throughout his career, he has worked to reform corporate accountability and responsiveness to shareholders. In short, Mr. Pickens is an innovator, motivator, and entrepreneur his longtime associate, Bobby Stilwell, said it best in 2004, the thing you have to understand about Boone is that it's all about action. Besides being very much a leader for our time, T. Boone Pickens has also been recognized for his generous philanthropy. He's a major contributor to his alma mater, and the Oklahoma State University School of Geology is named for him. He's also provided significant donations to Hurricane Katrina relief and to the University of Texas Healthcare Centers. Over the course of his career, he has donated nearly a half billion dollars to philanthropic causes. In response to our national dependence on foreign oil imports and the growing world demand for new oil reserves, he has introduced a plan to move our country toward cleaner and greener sources of energy. The Pickens plan, as he will explain to you in today's lecture, identifies wind energy, natural gas, and biofuels as the fuels of the future. 
Georgetown University is proud to welcome T. Boone Pickens, a leader and visionary in energy reform, to our campus for the second time this year to share his ideas and to engage our community in the growing national dialogue about energy. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you T. Boone, T. Boone Pickens. Jack, thank you very much. Uh, fellow geologist Timothy, we'll try to give him a good geological uh, overview. Uh, today, uh, I get to talk, and I promise you what I'm going to tell you is worth hearing. Uh, I know what I'm talking about, and in the future, of uh, my remarks as to the future and all, it's about you and not about me. <clears throat> the, um, the, just to bring two numbers together today, the $700 billion bailout of Wall Street or financial markets or whatever, that was a number used. I promise you it'll be substantially more than that when they get through. But let's hang on to $700 billion for a second. That's exactly what it costs us to buy oil every year at $150 a barrel, $700 billion a year. It's interesting, those, uh, I know it's a coincidence, but it still got my attention. The $700 billion a year that we pay for foreign oil is four and a half times the cost of the Iraqi war. And we do not have one politician that ever says uh, that the, uh, uh, Senator McCain does use $700 billion. He does not, he never compares it to the cost of the Iraqi war. Uh, it's interesting, and, and what the energy issue with the two candidates that we have now for president gets very, very little time for them to explain to us what they're going to do to reduce the $700 billion. Now, think with me a second that we cannot, we cannot have pay $700 billion a year for oil for very long. Uh, it won't be very long either because the price will go up. And if you extend out for 10 years, where, let's, where will we be in 10 years with $700 billion? Well, that's $7 trillion, We know that. But I promise you it will be over $10 trillion will be the cost by the time you go out 10 years. Now, we're not going to do that, but what are we going to do to stop it? If you look back over the 40 years in America, we have had no energy plan. Now, they've passed some uh, meaningless legislation that, about energy, but it never did one thing for the cost of energy or the rising dependency on foreign oil. And today, we are importing almost 70% of the oil we use every day. That's, that's huge. It is a security problem for us. Somebody said, you talk about the economics of it, you talk about the security of it, which one do you think most important? Either one. I mean, they both are, are going to drown us that we cannot, for instance, we can't, uh, it, we struggle with health care and education and uh, welfare, I mean, uh, Social Security reform. We, if we don't get the energy problem solved, you aren't going to have the money to address any of those. I mean, it's, it's going to be just, uh, we, it just isn't there. Okay, I want to take you, I'm going to mark on the board. I love to w write on the, on the whiteboard, so you just have to put up with me. We did a, we did a uh, we've done a lot of focus group work, and here in Washington we had, oh, 10 people in a group, and I was behind the black wall. They couldn't see me, so I could see them. And as it, the questions went around the room, and they showed these ads of mine, and then they showed one of me working at the whiteboard and explaining what all this meant to us. And quickly I identified uh, a 45-year-old woman that was intelligent, no question. And she said uh, uh, that uh, I wouldn't watch this unless you were paying me $100 for the uh, focus group work. And uh, I thought, well, that's nice. She said, I would turn that off. 
she didn't like me, obviously, and I was starting to develop a feeling about her, too. And <laughs> I, uh, I said, she has to be the valedictorian of her class, and I bet you she was a homeroom monitor, too. See, I was not a good student, a real good student, so I'm, I'm you know, a, a critical of, of uh, people that were valedictorians. But anyway, as it circled the table two or three times, she finally said, it, and Peter uh, Hart was the uh, was a moderator of it. You may know Peter Hart. He's, uh, you know, uh, a pollster, and he does this kind of work. He's very considered to be one of the best. And she said, she looked at it and said, is this guy terminal or something? And Peter Hart said, what do you mean terminal? She said, I have the feeling that he is, uh, he is, uh, feels bad about what he's done and that he's found oil and he's polluted with the oil and all. She didn't mention that she had been buying it for her car. So we're both guilty of something if anybody's guilty. But she said, I think he's terminal and he's trying to repent now and do something good before he dies. And I, I said, can I slip her a note under the door? And they, they didn't allow it. Let me, go to the, the, let me go to the problem, and then I'm going to give you a... I think we've got the problem identified. It's $700 billion. We can't stand it. <clears throat> we peaked, we peaked in, uh, on oil production in America in 1970. And... It, and that was at 10 million barrels a day, which is about what the Saudis and the Russians produce now. They're 9 million plus. But we peaked in 70, and then we have declined since then. And now we're producing about 5 million barrels a day. So it's, and another number, let me give you two or three numbers, that another number to focus on is we're importing 12 million barrels a day. And the Saudis are producing about 9. So if we solved our problem and drilled our way out of the problem, which a lot of people believe we could do, that uh, we would be a bigger producer than the Saudis would be. That's unlikely. And uh, it isn't going to happen. And I'm amused at some of the politicians that really must believe it. I'm not going to call them liars. And, uh, but they stand up in front of a crowd and say that we will drill our way out of the problem. Uh, so I don't believe that that can happen. Now, I'm going to put uh, two or three numbers up on the board. God, I love these. These are the best whiteboards that I've ever used. I've, I've, never, I've, I've gone from this size to something bigger. And the other day, I got the, the pen out to write at the D Democrat uh, uh, convention in Denver, and I was speaking to 600 bloggers. And I went to the whiteboard I thought was a whiteboard, and it was the screen for the projector, and I had my pen out, and they said, no, 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 Mr. Pickens, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't, that's the screen. So, okay, I said, well, I've written on a lot of tablecloths, but I never had written on a screen before. Now, if this pen works, it will be the only one that has. Uh, I'm going to put, it works. I've always had to pick up another pen, so $700 billion. I'm going to put the 70% up, and this is a number I haven't mentioned, but the world production daily is 85 million barrels. We use, the United States uses, 21 million barrels a day. So. We are using 25% of all the oil with 4% of the population, and we only have 3% of the reserves. Focus on that a second. Doesn't look too good. That we're using 25% of the oil with only 4% of the people. But we have operated for the last 40 years, after we started to decline in the 70s, that we were importing in the late 70s, 24% of all oil use in the United States. Our demand was going up rapidly. By the time we get to the Gulf War in 91, we're importing 42%. 
So I, I couldn't believe that this was happening to us. So I, 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 I don't know, I comment about a lot of things. And so I got on the road, made some speeches that if we get to the end of the 90s, we will be importing 60% of our oil. And there were several articles written that I'd completely lost my mind that of course we wouldn't be doing that. And some even remembered back in 74 when Richard Nixon said, by the end of the decade, we will not import any more oil. Decade of the 70s. We were, though. We were up to 30% at that time. So every president, every president and candidate for president, after Richard Nixon, made numerous speeches where they would say, elect me and we will be energy independent. Nothing happened. And today I spoke to the Washington National Press Club, and I said, part of that's your problem, because you did not hold them to it. I never saw a person that said that was ever questioned that when will you be reducing our dependency on foreign oil? They never had to answer a question like that. I don't understand that. That's always been a little bit confusing to me. And I threatened to start carrying a whistle and that every time that one of these politicians got up and said something incorrect about energy, I would blow the whistle. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? To, <laughs> but it, it did, it made a point, though. I mean, it, there were time after time after time that I would hear this. So as it progressed and we started in to this uh, election period, I talked a lot to my wife, you know, and she was starting to have problems with her ear and they examined her ear and said the noise you're taking in is causing you to have a cauliflower ear that's a joke <laughs> but she was getting tired of it and so she then she then uh, at two o'clock in the morning uh, I am now have awakened her and I'm telling her I said somebody has got to tell the people in this country what we're up against because they do not understand but they're becoming very very uneasy about it this is at the point of four dollar gasoline and I said that they're they're thinking somebody's lying to them about what the energy prospects and and the problems that face us are going to be like and I don't think politicians lied I don't think they knew I don't think they understood the uh, the problem but here is the problem. We've got 700 billion and 70 percent imports, and we're using 25 percent of all the oil, and we only have four percent of the population. Now, the question comes: All right, if you're going to solve the problem, what do we have to work with? So we list off what we have. We've got oil. We produce five million barrels a day, and we have two million natural gas liquids, which is like oil. So we have seven million barrels, which is one-third of the 21 million okay but oil I'll get to that how we're gonna do that one but next and the largest uh, resource is coal natural gas biofuels geothermal uh, wind solar nuclear what have I left off Hydro. Anything else? Okay. You look down the list, there are only two on there that will go after the $700 billion. The directly uh, reduce it. Biofuels, which how, how have we liked the way that's unfolded? That's the ethanol, and uh, that's been kind of a First, a hard thing to sell. After it was sold, then it was a hard thing to explain. And will it work? Yes. It's not as, uh, it won't move an 18-wheeler. It can be blended in with gasoline. You know that. We do that. And it's actually, the ethanol is uh, coming from corn. And uh, now we've run the price of corn up to where the uh, people in Mexico are complaining about the cost of tortillas which, you know, you think, God, how did we ever get in this deal? You know, we're trying to solve our energy problem, and people in Mexico complaining about a tortilla. But that's kind of that's the way the thing unfolded, you know. 
So now everybody has moved away from ethanol, and, you know, they don't want to touch it. But we did generate 1.5 million barrels out of the, uh, out of the corn, and that did add to the 7 million, which made us 8.5, still substantially below what we need. Now, the only other one that does it is here, which is natural gas. Interesting, because natural gas is a better fuel than gasoline or diesel. It's cleaner, it's cheaper, it's abundant, and it's ours. And I know you're thinking about what I just said. You think, if it's all that, why didn't we use it in the first place? You didn't use it in the first place because the automobile started in 1900. As you went forward, gasoline was the fuel. It became the culture we lived in was the automobile, gasoline, and all. And there were those that did not want natural gas to become a transportation fuel. Those were the chemical companies, the automobile companies, and the major oil companies. They preferred that you not do it. Well, everything at this point is pretty cheap. And if you look at the, the, the worst problem of all is we didn't have leadership that pointed everything out to us and told us about it. But second was gasoline was cheap. Uh, oil was cheap. Oil was cheap over the 40 years you had cheap oil. So there was no pressure to do anything. And we didn't. We did nothing. We developed no alternative energy. We, uh, we saw no way out of our problem other than to continue to drift further and further. But it was not uncomfortable. It was sort of, I said one time, I said, I feel like I've been floating down the Niagara River for a number of years. And when I got in the boat, it was very calm. Everything was slow moving. I progressed. And I started, after some period of time, started to take inventory of what was in the boat. There was no oar, there was no motor, and there was no preserver. And I was starting to hear water running. Now I'm getting ready to go over. Well, that's exactly where we are now. We drifted, drifted, drifted. We did nothing because it was very calm. Things was a nice day. Everything was working fine. Then we got $4 gasoline. People started to wake up, thought somebody was telling them, uh, they were lying to them and all, and as it unfolded that we've come down to a point where we now, our security is at risk and our economy is at risk. So what do you do about it? You can use the natural gas as a transportation fuel And you also, here is the pie for power generation. That's a pretty good circle for an 80-year-old guy, wasn't it? <laughs> you all thought I wasn't going to match up at the top. 50% is coal. 20% nuke. 22% natural gas. And this is hydro and miscellaneous. Okay. I'm interested in this 22% right here. Because this is transportation fuel. It also is for power generation. All that's good. It is the best hydrocarbon that, of the, all the hydrocarbons, the natural gas is the, is the superior one. Now, one very fortunate thing that's happened to our country that in 10 years we have tripled the reserves of natural gas. How did we do it? We did it technology. There are carboniferous shales located in a number of basins in the United States and those carboniferous shales have gas in them and that was the source rock to put it in the reservoirs of sand and carbonates. By heat and pressure, it was pushed out and into those, those reservoirs. Now we figured out a way to get the gas that's left in the carboniferous shales out. That's good. Very smart on our uh, technicians that they developed fracture treatments that we could do that. Very lucky for America this happened because now we have, what, we have the uh, resource that can get us out of the jam that we're in. So here, 22% natural gas. I'm going to now take this off 
and hold that. I'm dealing with very smart people at a university. So whatever I give you, I know you're going to retain, unless you sleep. I, this is late in the day. I know it's 4 o'clock, and, and this was doze time for me when I was your age. I, I could fall asleep real easy. But stick with me for a second. Now look at the board and, and envision that it's the United States. This would be the West Coast, Canada, Mexico, and the East Coast. Here is the model town. Everything I do has a model. I don't do r and I'm too old. So I have to have something that I can refer to now, and I use it again and again if it's good to use. Sweetwater, Texas has 2,000 megawatts of wind power. 2,000 megawatts of wind power, and this is a rural Texas town that looks like rural America. That is, it has declined. Uh, young people leave. <clears throat> they only come back for a visit. There's no career opportunities in some of these towns. I'm now going to revitalize with my energy plan, rural America. And Sweetwater, Texas is my first model for that. This town was 12,000, went below 10,000, now is back up above 12,000, <clears> and and it is 25% of the jobs in Sweetwater are wind related. So when I look at the wind corridor of the United States, it looks like this. And you can see Sweetwater is actually on the south end of it. Why? Because <clears throat> it was closest to the grid. So the, the wind, uh, the power that it generated, they could get it into the grid easily. So what you need up through here is you need a grid that then expands out into a national grid. So this plan is now starting to go to a national grid, which we now have uh, somebody said the other day, said if Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, he is not the guy I'm looking for. I'm looking for Thomas Edison. Okay. <laughs> Jefferson, rest. That uh, uh, Now Thomas Edison shows up, and he finds there's some of the uh, grid that still exists that he installed. That's about how old the national grid is. A guy in Montecito, California the other day asked me, he said, we have rolling brownouts continually during the summer and have had for several years, why can't we get those fixed? And I said, because you have a grid that's outdated and until you replace it, it will continue to have brownouts. So that's what we're facing. And now you're listening to this because this is your problem, not my problem. So the grid is one of the things that your generation will be involved in. And it'll be a huge uh, process the way it all takes place. So you're going to have to generate the power in this wind corridor uh, here. In the wind corridor here, and then you have the solar corridor here. So these are now renewables that are going to be extremely important to us in the future. Somebody said, why haven't we done this before? Cheap oil. Remember, cheap oil has gotten us into this spot, and we now have to get ourselves out. But we've got to get ourselves out with big numbers. I met with Senator Obama a month ago, and we talked at length about this, and uh, he said, I said, something you say bothers me. He said, what is it? I said, you say you're going to have a million plug-in hybrids. And he kind of straightened up in his chair and he said, yes, and I'm going to do that too. And I said, Senator, if you looked out on the parking lot here and saw a million cars, it looked like one hell of a lot of cars, wouldn't it? He said, it sure would. I said, now elevate to the problem. The problem is we have 250 uh, million vehicles in America. One million is nothing. I said, don't throw it away. Uh, keep it. Anything we got that's American, keep it. But you've got to think about 50 or 100 million vehicles to solve this problem. One million is nothing. And he paused a second and he said, it's not very many, is it? 
But you don't, you don't focus on how big the problem is and think you're doing something when actually the problem is so huge you aren't even scratching the surface. Okay, now here, this becomes wind in this area right here. And we're going to revitalize rural America. So we got a lot of stuff going on this afternoon. The put back, I mean, this is the, uh, the power pi, the here, 22% natural gas. Now, in the wind, in a study done in uh, April of 07 by the Department of Energy that they have you, re, you doing the next 200,000 megawatts, which we have 987,000 megawatts operating in the United States now. So they're going to increase it in 10 years. You need 200,000 megawatts in 10 years, but they're going to take 20 years to do it. I don't know why they're going to take twice as long as you need it, but that's, I don't know, I'm not going to say that's the way government works, but I sort of am suspicious that that's the way it works. But we can put that 200,000 megawatts into this, into this quarter uh, pretty easy if we have transmission uh, uh, exits out of the corridor into the east and west coast. So here, let's say that we do 22% on wind for power generation, and I take that here and remove the natural gas and put it to transportation. Now, this presentation I made at the White House three months ago, and when I wrote this number up, that I can, if I can take the 22 out of here, replace that with wind, and go to transportation fuel, that number is 38%. 38% of that is about $300 billion. Think. What would $300 billion do for us Americans? It would create jobs, profits made, taxes paid, and the economy moves. It would be fabulous to go to wind in the central corridor, generate jobs again. If you had a PTC, a production tax credit, for 10 years, which would cost $15 billion a year, so that's a lot of money, not when you look at the $700 billion. The $700 billion is so huge, it gives us the opportunity to do really most anything we want to to help ourselves. We have gotten so far underwater on energy that we can do anything and be better off than what we're doing. So here you would do a 10-year PTC. That would do the win for you. And... The, it would bring in, the 10 years would bring the manufacturers into the Great Plains of the United States. That's good because if you look at those, uh, those uh, uh, windmills, that the hub on it is 280 feet up from the surface, and then you have 120 radius above that for the blade. You're 400 feet up, and that's 40 stories. So those are huge, and so when you're making them, you need to make them close to where you're going to install them. So that's going to revitalize rural America. That's part of the, the story. Now, the, uh, I'm going to ask my helpers, have I left anything out? Oh, the battery. Yeah, oh, the bridge. The, the natural gas is not the answer forever. What is the answer? That's your problem again, not mine. I'm serious now. You think about what I'm saying because the bridge for natural gas is going to take you out 20 or 30 years. Okay, I'm 80, so I'm out of the game, you know, out of 120 years out. I mean, that's, I, mean I might be 120. But anyway, the point of it is you're going to have to get on another fuel. The future will be the battery, electric, or hydrogen, probably, unless somebody comes up with some other plan. But that's not my problem, again, your problem. Now, that the natural gas will bridge you to the next generation. Now, where, this is where Al Gore and I part. Uh, 
Al and I have talked about this, and he said, well, look, I can buy the natural gas as being cleaner than gasoline or diesel. Yeah, 80% cleaner. Now, can you imagine us being so lucky to have a fuel that is cheaper, cleaner, and abundant? That's a real break for our team on that one. And he said, I said, well, can you come out for my plan? He said, I can't do it. Can you come out for my plan? I said, I can't do it because I said, you're on page two for me. I believe that global warming is here, and it's causing us a great amount of grief, but not nearly as serious as the $700 billion and the 70%. That, to me, is page one out. And I said, if I have enough energy left after I get page one solved, then I'll go to work on page two with you. But you come over to page one right now. We're having lunch on Wednesday in New York, so this subject will be discussed again. But the, the, when I ask these guys, he wants to go to the battery, you know, like Monday morning. Uh, he wants to cut out all hydrocarbons. you got to be realistic. You have to be realistic. We can't cut out the hydrocarbons. We're, we're hooked on them. But we can get off of the, the gasoline and diesel, which is the dirty end of the deal. And But when you ask these guys that are so big on the battery, you ask them, say, you realize the battery won't move an 18-wheeler. And you don't, I bet if I asked for hands in this room, I bet I wouldn't have 15 people raise their hand on that. I will. How many knew that? Whoops. Well, that's because you listen to me all the time. It's my daughter. <laughs> they, but you didn't realize that. I mean, we speak of fuels transportation fuels and we kind of just broad brush it and but you, you know you have to be suspicious on the battery when you see the boat you know four of you big guys out there could carry that boat across the room so you think well if they can carry the boat maybe the battery won't move the 18 wheeler it won't okay so we have to have more time to get to the battery uh, as as the answer or to the hydrogen People say, you don't like the hybrid. I like everything that's American. Everything. I have no, no fuel, nothing. And, and it's when I met with Senator McCain, he's really big on nuclear. And he said, you, you're opposed to nuclear. I said, no, sir. I said, nuclear too. Anything, drill. He said, are you opposed to drilling? No, drill. You're not going to get a whole hell of a lot, I can tell you that. That's, that's way overstated. That... Uh, don't have the idea that we can drill our way out of this problem because there's not enough oil left to find. The places you're looking for it now are the last places you look for oil. The first place you look is in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's been pretty well drilled up. Evidence of that is a month ago they had the, the, the western Gulf of Mexico sale. It was 18 million acres. I told Carl Pope of Sierra Club, I said, Carl, you get heartburn over this drilling. And he said, yeah. I said, well, watch this sale. And I said, 50% of the tracks, 9 million acres of the 18, will not get a bid. Well, he said, how do you know that? I said, because it's not any good, and I've been in the business for over 50 years. I know what I'm talking about. And he said, all right, well, I'm going to check that. And I said, well, I know you will. I will, too. So the day after the, after the sale, he called me. And he said, God, you know more about this business than anybody I know. And I said, Carl, I felt like I missed on this sale. He said, no, no, you said that there would be half of it would not be bid upon. I said, that's right. And I said, it was 90% didn't get a bid. Only 10% got a bid. He said, well, I don't care. He said, I had no idea that, that it wouldn't all have bids for it. And so 90%, that told you something. That's an indication of what's going to happen. When you put it up for sale off the West Coast and East Coast, there's not going to be a great amount of interest in it. The reason that the... Gulf of Mexico is the best place to look for oil is because of the Mississippi, Mississippi River, which was there hundreds of millions of years, and dumped sediments into the Gulf of Mexico that developed nice structures and, and traps for oil and gas. But off the West Coast, there are not many big rivers going into the West Coast that, that develop those kind of delta systems and all, and the East Coast is even worse. So you're not going to, don't have any idea that somebody's going to get lucky and, and find enough oil to take care of us. In Anwar, there's uh, uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is, um, is kind of in a peculiar spot. 
there's only one pipeline from the uh, from the uh, Arctic Coastal Plain from Dead Horse down to uh, Valdez, Alaska, and that only carries two million barrels a day. And there's not going to be a second pipeline. Now remember, we're using 21 million barrels a day, and we're importing 12 million. Now that's included in the 21. So if we get at the present time, the Alaska pipeline has one million barrels in it. It's declined to one million from, it was two million uh, 15 years ago. So if we are successful at Anwar, then we're go all we're going to do is fill up two million barrels, which is 10% of the oil that we use. That's a nice addition. It'd only be 5% because you have a million in it already. But it, it would be a nice addition, but it isn't going to solve our problem. More people believe that Alaska is the answer to energy for America, and that's not so. What else have I forgotten? The what? Mexico? Yeah, we're, we're in, we are uh, importing about a million barrels a day from Mexico. They will be, a, uh, they will be an importer themselves in five years. So they're fast going out of the business. So when you look around the world, and that uh, whatever you see today and whatever you're told today by knowledgeable, intelligent people, you can never, never you, what will happen is it will never be better than they tell you. If they say it's going to be a million barrels of oil five years from now, I promise you it'll be closer to 500,000 than it will be a million. They, we always, all of us, are guilty of uh, our estimates on production of oil and gas are always more generous than the reservoir is willing to give us. Okay, what else? What? Oh, yeah. They, it's interesting. The Iranians two months ago announced that they were converting all their vehicles over to natural gas. Why? Cheaper, cleaner, abundant, and theirs. And sell us the oil. Why not? You know, think about it. And now Gazprom, the Russian uh, giant, is putting natural gas fueling stations all over Europe. Why? Same thing. It's cheaper, it's cleaner, it's theirs, and they'll sell the oil. And so here we are. We've done nothing for 40 years. We're just in worse shape that you could get into. But now you've got to fix it. And you got lucky. You got lucky. You have the natural gas and you have the wind, and you have the solar. And geothermal is going to be a factor someplace in here. Google is working very, very hard on geothermal ideas. So when you turn the people loose in America and say, we now know the problem, we've got to get loose from the 700 billion and the 70 percent, I can tell you the people in America will come together and do it. It has nothing to do with politics, nothing at all. It's all us together, and we can do it. We can solve the problem. But if anybody thinks I'm out doing this because I'm trying to make money, we'll forget it. I've got enough money. I don't need any more money. And I'd a lot rather be playing golf this afternoon in Del Mar, California, than I would be paddling around Washington trying to convince everybody that we have a crisis in energy. But. And I'm 80, I told you that four times now, but, well, the reason I say that, because I don't think that I, I the next presidential race, I think if we don't start fixing this before 84, excuse me, before 2012, not when I'm 84, that, <laughs> that if we don't start fixing it before then, we could be just, that, that's it, that we're, we're sunk on the deal. So I felt like I had to go now with the story. I put together a budget. It was $58 million is what I'm spending to do this. And uh, it's, uh, and it, you know, it, it's important. It's important to you. It's very important to me. But I felt like I was the guy that knew the story. And kind of in America, I see it that if, if you're the one that understands, you're the one that knows, and you're really one of the team players, which I believe I am, then it's up to you to go out and do it. And so that's what I'm doing at Georgetown today. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Pickens, for that very engaging talk this afternoon. And Mr. Pickens has also uh, graciously agreed to take a few questions. So if you have a few questions, or one, please make your way to the center aisle over there for that mic. Looks like we do have a question. Sir. Mr. Pickens, uh, thank you for coming to speak today. Um, in seeing the details of your plan uh, just now and on the commercials and everything, I thought, thought it was a pretty good idea, but one thing that's just been bothering me about it is you give these great quotes for the amount of power we can produce through wind energy in, in the Great Plains corridor, but aren't we going to lose a lot of that in transmitting it to you know farther parts of the country? Um, and isn't there a lot of uh, inefficiency and power loss when you transmit the power, which makes it more expensive per megawatt hour than uh, maybe what you're quoting? Okay. Uh, I understand the question. They, uh, I think that, that uh, I'm going to say I think because I'm not uh, I'm I'm not an expert in uh, uh, transmission of, uh, of power, but I'm told by by my engineers it'd be less than five percent loss. Uh, one thing that your question reminds me of: if we had a national grid and fixed that, we probably could save. 20%, we'd be 20% more efficient with a national grid than we are now, which is very, very important. But I think on the transmission from the, uh, the and I like the location of the central part of the United States because of terrorists. Uh, it, it would be less uh, vulnerable than it would be on the east and west coast. The east and west coast, if you're going to do the wind, you're going to have problems on the NIMBY uh, deal, not in my backyard uh, deal. Where in in, uh, in the Midwest or the central part of the United States that, uh, that the landowners there want this. Give you a quick story that I was with an ABC crew down in Sweetwater <clears throat> and, a, and they were asking questions and trying to understand you know, what this had meant to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to Sweetwater in having uh, you know, the, the wind energy there and all. And so this guy, they picked the wrong guy and I could have told them he was the wrong guy. He was standing on a street corner in Sweetwater, kind of like this, had a cowboy hat on, and the guy came over to him and he said, uh, uh, you live here? Yep. Uh, you, uh, were you here when they put these wind turbines up? Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you, how do you like the wind turbines? Like them? Can't get a conversation, see? The last question was, who is it that doesn't like them? No. Do you know anybody that doesn't like them? Answer, yep. <laughs> Exciting now, a reporter is excited. Who is it that doesn't like them? God doesn't have them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it'll work. Don't, you, you need to be inquiring and on any of these questions, but stay on the positive side of your thinking because this has to be done. You, you ha when you know you have to do something, you know, it's a little different than if you have options whether I do or I don't. Because if you don't hear, then you're for foreign oil. And that will not work. We already know it won't work. So it's going to get worse, and I've already explained to you on that. I've got to give you another story from my county in Roberts County. Mr. White, he was born and raised in Roberts County. He was 90 years old. They had a birthday party for him at the high school gymnasium and all the people there to, uh, to congratulate him. And uh, he had lived in the county his entire life, really didn't like to travel out of the county. He liked to be there. And somebody said to him, said, you know, congratulations, Mr. White, said, you've been here 90 years. And he said, that's right, I was born and raised here. And said, well, Mr. White, you've seen a lot of changes in 90 years, haven't you? And he said, yeah, and I was against every damn one of them. <laughs> so, be for it, help me on it, and at the same time, be critical. That's okay. Next question. Uh, hi, Mr. Pickens. Um, my name is Dan Yi, and I'm with, um, with a startup company in Arlington working with ultracapacitor technologies. I have a question regarding, um, well, very much related to the previous question, which is you're dumping you know, all these megawatts of wind energy onto the grid, but wind energy is an intermittent source of energy. And you know, even with the most sophisticated grid in the world, you know, the Spanish system, 
they can take about 12%, you know, wind energy. How are you going to have this nation have that much wind without a sufficient, you know, storage technology or, you know? Well, the storage technology will come for, uh, for it. But first, we've run a lot of MET uh, tests on the, on the wind. And the wind that we're dealing with is about 40% uh, percent of the time is what it is. It's, it's high. And, it, and for anything above 30 percent, you consider to be good and getting better the higher you get. But you're gonna, that's just another thing you're going to be tasked to do. You're going you're gonna to blend the solar in, too. Texas is the largest producer of wind energy now. California is number two. Iowa is three. And the largest in the wind energy business is uh, Warren Buffett. So it's not a foolish idea. It will work. Germany's most highly developed of any country for wind. They don't even have good wind. And, but they realized they didn't have oil. And the French don't have oil. And they have 80% nuclear. And we don't have oil, but we act like we have oil. <laughs> because it was cheap. And so all of that, uh, I don't have the, you know, uh, detailed responses, but uh, it's, all of this is going to be done. I mean, we're, we're smart people. We're not going to sit here and go down the drain with foreign oil. Okay, next question. Hi, Mr. Pickens. I really appreciate your use of figures, especially within um, context. I know you mentioned a tax credit that you were proposing. Do you have any numbers for how much it's going to cost companies to develop wind power or solar power per energy unit compared to natural gas and oil that would indicate where, where you want to implement a tax credit and how you want to do that to encourage businesses okay. to go to the field? Okay, tax credit that I'm talking about is the one that's in existence, which takes care of solar and wind both. And so I just want them to extend it 10 years so that that pulls the manufacturers in to the uh, corridor so, because they won't come in unless they know that the government is going to support this, uh, this effort. So that's, uh, and that's the only tax credit I have in mind. Is it needed to make wind power financially viable? I couldn't hear it. I couldn't understand it. Yeah, it, it, what it'll do, it, you can, uh, not exactly because it, you have had the PTC and they, they, you know, they extend it every one or two years. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to say to make it, to make it uh, uh, happen uh, quickly, you're going to have to have it. Hi, Mr. Pickens. Um, I have another question about taxes. The oil we currently get and the gas we get at a gas station is taxed, and we use from that um, the money for road construction. If we switch over to natural gas, will you tax that, or how will that relate to how will we get the taxes and the money from that to finance road construction? Well, good question, because that's, that's exactly where our uh, highway money comes from is off the taxes of natural gas. I'm, I'm supposing if, if when you get up into pretty good volumes, it's going to be taxed uh, similar to gasoline okay. is what I think. So natural gas, you got a great break, though. Let me give you another number to focus on that this is extremely important that one MCF natural gas one MCF natural gas equals eight gallons of gasoline so those those do the same job the cost of the eight gallons it's not four but let's say it's close to four so we'll call it thirty dollars my grandson's sitting here said what he'd be He said, yes. He sh you should know because you're driving that car. You ought to know exactly what. Because I bet you buy one gallon at a time or something, don't you? <laughs> okay, one MCF of natural gas is $8. So you have a four-to-one favorable relationship to gasoline. Again, I've been saying it's cheaper, it's cleaner, and it's abundant. So what's going to happen? Somebody said, yeah, well, 
what will happen is when you move this over here, this is going to go up. That's right. But say it goes up to $15. That's still. We have plenty of natural gas. Plenty of natural gas. So I don't know what it goes up to, but it will go up. There's no question. Next. Hi, Mr. Pickens. Uh, your plan is to reduce dependence on foreign oil, but you mentioned how inefficient it is uh, to keep drilling in the U.S., but you said you support it, so why not um, reduce dependence on oil, all oil? Why just foreign oil? I don't. Give me how I'm going to do it. No, I mean, why not reframe the issue to reduce dependence on all oil? Okay. Why how, do you support domestic drilling? Well, how are you going to do it? Give me how you, you're, you're using 70% of all the oil used every day <clears throat> is used for transportation. So you say, okay, we're going to reduce the dependency on our own and on our imported too. What are we going to use in place of it? See, 70%, I'm giving you another number that sounds the same, but 70% of goods movement in America, that's the trucks. 70% uh, of all the oil used is used for goods movement. First, 70% of all the oil is used for transportation. Now, 70% of that number is used for trucks. So all I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get capture the trucks. But I don't understand you're, uh, you're saying you want to reduce both of them, but you haven't responded on how you're going to do it. I'm just referring to... Uh, that what? I'm referring to, you said you had a conversation with John McCain where you support everything American, including increasing drilling. So, Well, the, I, I did that. I told uh, Senator Obama the same thing. I'm for everything in America. I'm for drilling. I'm for nuclear. I'm for everything. But when you say I'm going to reduce both of them, I don't know. you got to... I, I thought you were going to say, well, let's walk and ride bicycles or something. And that, and there's no question that will work. <laughs> okay, next question. Hello, Mr. Pickens. Uh, what about also increasing funding for research of uh, new development for refinement technology for, like, uh, oil sands, uh, being as most of the oil in the world is actually... Now, are you talking about oil sands or oil shale? Oil sands. You're talking about in Canada? Yeah. Okay. Well, you've got, uh, you're producing up there uh, 2 million barrels a day now. Is there any way to increase that production? Well, the, yeah, they'll increase it, but the, the cost now to, uh, you, to have a 12% uh, return, you've got, a, you've got to have $85 oil, which we do have, but there's not many people that jump in on a deal where they where they got to have $85 oil at this point. But you're going to get that production, uh, the oil sands, is the it's equivalent to Saudi oil on reserves or in the oil sands, 250 billion barrels. And uh, you're going to get that up probably to 5 million barrels, and I think that's just about all you can do. I lived in Canada in 67 when the great Canadian oil sands project was funded by the government. And uh, it was, at that time, oil was selling for $1.67 because I remember the day that they that they gave the notice that it was going to be developed. And so uh, when we walked across the street from the uh, uh, Calgary Petroleum Club, I walked across the street that day, and we were talking about it. It was after work. We'd go by there and have a beer. And, uh, and I was with Harley Hotchkiss, who is still a dear friend of mine in Calgary. And uh, he said, you know, Boone, that's a government deal. And he said, if it makes sense and ever makes any money, you'd have to have $5 oil. Now we have 145, but you know, at that time it was so it was so out of uh, you know off the chart that now you, the same things. I mean, don't don't think you aren't going to see $300 oil. You are. All of you'll see. I'll see $300 oil, and uh, so the uh, the numbers will get uh, bigger and bigger. Let me have the next question. Thank you very much for coming out here, Mr. Pickens. And uh, as an question. Oklahoman, I'd especially like to thank you for all the philanthropy you've done on behalf of my home state, uh, Oklahoma State in particular. Did you go to Oklahoma State? 
No, I go here, sir, but <laughs> my dad well, did. I, I thought maybe you flunked out at Oklahoma State. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, sir. <laughs> Where are you from in Oklahoma? Uh, Tulsa. Tulsa. Yes. Well, if you can't be from Holdenville, Tulsa is a good place. <laughs> it sure is. But I do have to ask you, sir, uh, for a visionary man like you, back in 2004, why weren't you given these constructive talks like this instead of bankrolling the despicable character assassinations of good men like John Kerry, put forth by the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth? Come on. Next question. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. It's from Oklahoma. You're better than that. Too. Um, hi. I was just wondering, could you talk about your pro-everything American? You have a long laundry list of um, things to do to get, you know, to reduce the $700 billion. I was wondering why you don't mention efficiency, if there's any particular reason. Don't do what? You don't mention increasing efficiency, increasing gas taxes or something like that to reduce consumption as a whole. You're saying raise the price. You, raise, said, you that, said add taxes? That could be part of the solution. But if you're talking about, you know, scrimping, oh, you know, and why that's one million, two, I think that's a two million barrel, uh, two million barrel day uh, choke point, and you're scrimping and saving at certain points, I was wondering why Efficiency isn't mentioned. I, I'm not sure I get it. Is, you're talking about better just, efficiency. Is that it? Just increasing efficiency. In oh, the yeah, we've got to do that. There's no question. I had the guys from Business Roundtable come see me the other day. And they're talking about that their, their, their conservation plan could reduce uh, the dependency by 40% uh, percent in 25 years. And I said, I can't stand 25 years. I said, I've got to have it now. But no, I think that uh, conservation. See, the way I the the uh, kind of I haven't said this, and I, I do want to say it, and I'm glad your question caused me to think of it. But what the way I see this unfolding is that uh, we're going to do what pretty well what I said we should do because when you get down to it, you don't have. And when I was talking to Senator McCain, he said, "Well, you're trying to get me to pick winners." I'm talking about natural gas, I said. It's not a case of picking winners. That's the only thing you have. It's not like, you know, you have uh, three life preservers there. Which one am I going to grab? There's only one. You've only got one. So now I said in the decision, this, is, this has to be done, and this is the way it's going to unfold. But as it goes forward, that, that they're going to be, this will become a huge patriotic issue in America. And you will have individuals that we will have, we'll figure out in three or four years, how to be on a domestic fuel. It will be just abhorrent to you to use foreign gasoline and diesel. You just won't want it. And the other day in Minneapolis, I, and I was, had questions from a press group, and after I made remarks, he said, well, I don't want to use natural gas. And I said, that's what's wonderful and great about this country. You don't have to. You can use whatever you want to use. I'm not asking to mandate anything to you or to me. We will do what we feel best about. And what will happen is we will go to a domestic fuel and we will become very efficient in how we handle energy is the way it's going to go. You are going to end up, all of you, Alexander, Liz, Lizzie or, or Mary Elizabeth, my grandchildren right here, let me tell you, when I was your age and I left a room and left a light on, my grandmother said, Sonny, cut the light off. First, it's hot in the summer, and it costs us money. So next month, if you continue to do that, you're going to get the electric bill. Well, I remembered that. I remember that. And I, to this day, walk out of a room, I cut off the light. I feel, you know, it's kind of unfair to use, uh, you know, energy in a wasteful way like that. And you're going to get, we're all going to get the same way about this, this subject before it's over. And you'll remember us being here at Georgetown. And 20 years from now, you're saying, I remember what that guy said that got up here and scratched on the blackboard or something, that he said, we're going to feel this way about energy and we're going to be very respectful of it and the value of it and what it really means to all of us that we will start to protect it and we'll get so much better in America. This will be like a war without guns, and we will march together is the way it's going to go. We, and we, what I want this president to do is monthly tell us how much less oil we're importing every month, 
and it'll, sh it'll be a scorecard. Now, see, this is available. Every week we get a number Wednesday. You get the number for imported oil. So once a month, I think he should come on and say, we're doing good. All of us are. It's not me, the president. It's us Americans. And we are beating a problem that has to be, we have to win. And I, I want this president, whether he's a Democrat or the Republican, I don't care, that I want him to, to approach this where it's going to be a, a tremendous unifying force for our country. And we'll do it. I mean, all of us will do it. Thank you very much. Well, this, this concludes our uh, lecture today, and thank you very much, Mr. Pickens, for this engaging and uh, um, a great amount of your time and energy.